You look lovely, Thorne. We want to welcome everyone watching this program, both live and as I speak, and on replay. And thank you for joining us. The Rarebook Cafe is the first internet video program in the entire world about antiquarian books. I'm your host, Steve the Bookman Eisenstein. Happy New Year. And today marks our fifth program in this our second series. I guess we're going to have points in different editions. We're also available now at Rare Book Cafe on Facebook, on YouTube, and at floridabookfair.blogspot.com. That's floridabookfair.blogspot.com, home of our sponsor, the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair. I'm joined today by my good friend Thorne Donnelly of Liberty Books in West Palm Beach. My beautiful wife Edie returns today after a couple of weeks on the team's disabled list. Welcome back, honey. Also back with us is our creator and producer, Alan Smith. He was attending his newest grandchild's christening this week. Congratulations. I hope there are Nobel Prizes in the future. And since getting back, he has been trying to figure out what our other co-host, Lindsay Thompson, did to his control room while filling in. Our guest today is book dealer and book fair promoter, Cynthia Gibson. Later in the program, we'll have Edie's Miniature Book Corner, starring my wife, Edie. If you love unusual books, you won't want to miss this. We'll also have a mix of our recurring features, including The Third Degree, Professor Donnelly's Collector's Corner, my latest obsession, amongst others. You can send us questions and comments through contact features of YouTube, Facebook, and Blogger whichever you are seeing us through. We'll be watching and responding on today's and future shows, too. If you're new to the program and want to be alerted about other episodes of the Rare Book Cafe, be sure to like and follow the show on Facebook and share it with your friends. And if you are listening to any other devices, please turn them on. Lindsay, are you thawed out from the cold yet? Well, we were on the uh, sort of weather roller coaster last uh, Saturday when we chatted. It was 12 degrees out. Yesterday it was 80 degrees, and today it's 49. But at least the ice is gone from the ground. I, I have no, except for New Year's Eve, that's about the only time I want to see snow, preferably in Times Square, but that's another story. We're delighted to have Cynthia Gibson join us today from somewhere on the globe. Uh, Cynthia runs a valuable new resource for the book trade, bookfairs.com. She's also been a rare and used book dealer for the Barnes & Noble chain, head honcho of her own bookstore, and may even more books has even more book school certificates than Thorne does. And I have credential envy, I'm telling you. <laughs> well, let's, let's start out with, I know we had some segments planned, so I will defer my segment now to just go right to talk to Cynthia, if that is okay with all. Good by me. Good. Cynthia, I have followed your site for ages. What got you started to put out the book fair calendar the rest of time? Well, I have to uh, give credit where it is due, which is, uh, this goes back to uh, many people in the trade will know Bruce Gventner, uh, who started bookfairs.com. He had the foresight early on to grab that URL when the internet was first coming out. And a few years wow. back, he uh, he decided that he, he uh, had had enough of uh, keeping up with the basically the herding of, of cats which is which is tracking down book fair dates and uh, he put the, the site up for grabs and uh, I and along with um, a, a dear compatriot uh, nabbed the thing and uh, Marvin Getman is another person who many people in the trade will be familiar with he and I grabbed the site together and uh, a year or so after that he he bailed on it too and let me let me run with it so um, as of now it is mine alone and I uh, have been adding bells and whistles and trying to get it out of training wheels for the last couple of years um, 
somewhere I read a quote about my book, Fear Lady. I love that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> where did I that have, come from? Yeah. I, I, I have my suspicions. <laughs> um, I won't well, name names. <laughs> I, I want to tell you, you know, I mean, I, I made up a song, Take Me Out to the Book Fair. I was trying to go uh, something from the, one like of the songs it. in My Fair Lady with that. I like it. I like it. Um, yeah, so, so what started with Bruce as, as just a very simple listing of, of as many book fairs as he could get the information on domestically has now grown into, um, well, if, if, if you don't mind, I'll show you some screenshots and what you do. see. Um, and okay, let's see what we got here. You know, while you're, while, while you're doing that, I, I know we used to, what, what I had shown, what I will show you if I'm doing this one, and, well, we have that on a screenshot too, so we'll, we'll, we can put that one up um, for the book fair calendar from AV. You, while you, are you ready to screenshot? Yes. Whenever, you're, whenever you are. So, go, go so this is the, the, the homepage of bookfairs.com, and um, as you can see, we've got, uh, these are current book fairs, the Book and Paper Row and the Texas Booksellers Association are both having book fairs right now as we speak. Um, and also there's a link here to, Thorne, you'll, you'll appreciate this. Here's a, a link to uh, Bibliography Week's activities. That's something coming up at the end of the month. It's not strictly a book fair, but it's book related. And that's really what I've tried to do with the site now. It's now got um, not just a complete listing of all of the fairs happening around the country for the rest of the year. Um, we've got pretty much everything is up and listed now. There are a few, a few holes left. You get the Allentown people on the phone with me any, as soon as you can, anybody who's, who's got a line into them. Um, we've got international fairs, so happening all around the globe from Germany to Hong Kong, Tokyo, uh, Australia. Um, We've got uh, handy links to other things, uh, for example, to library sales and literary festivals, things that I don't list all of myself, but I've got links to them here. So that'll take you right through to their websites. Um, he's he's waving me. Should stole a library sale. Do you have a listing for them, I ask? Uh, I don't know. Here's the Book Sale Finder website, though, and they would be the place to go for it. Um, Checking out for sure. That was always yeah. a great sale. That was always a we phenomenal sale. Where, where are they located? Uh, it's either, well, it's been a while, but it was either New Jersey or Connecticut. The thing that I remember distinctly about Waveney Mansion was you had to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to get there by 5 to decide which line you wanted to stand on at nine. And I have seen positions sold in that line for numbers of dollars. It was just one of the most amazing book sales that I went to because it was one of my first back in the mid seventies. Huh. Huge, huge. That's Massachusetts. I'm trying to get into Connecticut here to see. I didn't see it in New Jersey. Well, it's possible they didn't, you know, they don't do it anymore. But this was a library sale that took up a gymnasium, another room, and, you know, several buildings with you know different lines to stand on. One of the things, and I would I would have to think that you're part of this that we heard at the book fair this year with some degree of frequency was from younger people. This is our first book fair, and I I heard that enough last year at the book fair to know that they're getting this information somewhere. Um, that they showed up with the frequency that they did. So huh. I'm presuming it's a source or something the book fair itself did. I would love to believe that. Um, it, it depends on, of course, who. I am not a book fair promoter with a capital P. I'm a book fair booster is a better probably word to use. Um, there are several book fair promoters, actual people who do that for a living who who are just tremendous at how they promote their fairs um, and 
So I wouldn't want to take any credit where it's not due. For example, the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair people do a tremendous job uh, promoting their fair. Let me, absolutely, let me rephrase that in a different way. I think that bookfairs.com, because of what, you know, realize I'm very new to computers, okay? okay? And from what from what I have, that if they didn't hear about it from us locally, bookfairs.com is now all over the world. People can see it in any state, country, whatever. In the past, yes. no matter how good the advertising, I'm not talking about recent years, um, the fact that there's something online that covers the whole country is what I was trying to bring out. That's Yes, absolutely. And I that is absolutely my intent, to sort of spread the word. Thorne and I were talking the other day. Um, yeah. to, to spread the word to everyone from booksellers to book buyers that there are is literally some place to go see a book see, see books for sale every weekend out of the year there I have more than a hundred book fairs listed um, in in United States alone on an annual basis uh, which you know do the math that's at least you could easily go see two a weekend um, they're not completely spread out perfectly evenly across the country there's obviously a preponderance in the northeast and a number in the southwest also but um fewer in the southeast and uh, uh i was about to say fewer in the northwest although there are actually several now in the northwest and also some in the upper midwest so so there's a hole in the kind of in the middle of the country there's a hole We've got a donut but um but there are just somewhere cl close enough to drive to there's a tremendously just a lovely affair in Tennessee every year. Um, I'm excited about the, there are several now in Texas. Um, and uh, it's funny because we live, as you say, we, we, we sort of speak disparagingly of yourself um, about not being a really a computer person. I, I think the more and more the world becomes a technical realm, the more it is that people appreciate physical objects like books. There's mm -hmm. a, um, I hate to use the word fetish, but there's a, there's a, a almost a, well, there's an emotional connection to to objects that you can touch and feel that that just doesn't exist. I was I was saying to Thorne, I'm 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 as guilty as anyone. I'm a proud card carrying member of Amazon Prime. I love one click, but but there is just nothing that replaces going and browsing for things, um, especially because there are things on the internet you can only really look for things that you already know exist. You kind of have to have a sense of, of, of something being in the world in order to put in some keywords or some search parameters to find it online. Whereas if you're at a book fair, much like going to a museum or, or, or something like that, where you, you discover things that you had no idea existed until the moment you walked in the door. And unlike a museum, you can actually at a book fair pick these things up and hold them. and. You have your own private docents in the bookseller standing behind the, the counter who's more than thrilled to tell you all about it and to share his or her complete and absolute enthusiasm for the particular object. So I, I just, I can't encourage it enough. If you're at all interested in books and you haven't ever been to a book fair, you should go. And that's bookfairs.com. I'm seeing something here about something with, about ephemera. Yeah, uh, Cynthia, I was just wondering if, if you, one of the things we talked about on uh, you know, my little segment was ephemera, and she had some really great points to bring that because it's it just doesn't work on the internet, and we were there's just no well, Cynthia, you 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 can explain it there. Well, sure. So so uh, ephemera is just a fancy word for for things that weren't really meant to um, survive. So when we're talking about uh, in in the realms of in, in the realm of books 
and book collecting, we're talking about uh, often paper um, or uh, card cardboard paper, uh, things things like flyers for um, uh, love-ins or sit-ins back in the '60s, or ticket stubs to you know Grateful Dead concerts, or um, or you know you 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 name it, uh, posters for things. Um, uh, but also greeting cards, for example, there were these wonderful chromolithographic uh, die cut like uh, greeting card type things that were very popular in the 1880s, 1890s. <laughs> Um, that are very collectible, and those were just those were meant to, you know, put in the mail and send to a friend, and 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 be tossed out when grandma's papers got tossed out. But instead, uh, they are now a collecting um, area in their own right, and you know, it's something like that, a, a, a color printed die cut meaning meaning uh shapes cut out um uh kind of card on a variety of subjects i mean i don't know how you look for that on the internet it's, it's pretty tricky um to let me say, help but... let me may i may i add huh? on that Go okay ahead. first of all the definition of ephemera would be disposable by nature it was meant to be thrown away that seems to usually follow the word ephemera when you're asking for a definition of it I don't know if you are aware of it or not but there is a very large group on Facebook literally with the name ephemera put in the word ephemera and you will see that there is a group buying, selling, posting, advertising, and talking about ephemera literally as we speak. Um, I didn't know we were going here because what I was what I was just showing you that I put down, and now there it is, is literally an example of ephemera. It is an 1890s Hebrew New Year card. There is also Pop out. But what brought us into ephemera, I ask? Oh, um, well, just just so you know, I'm, I'm actually showing the Ephemera Society website right now uh, as we speak, um, which is, yes, one of my favorite websites. And um, that came from, I got there through a link on bookfairs.com, just, just, just saying, uh, which has a page called uh, People We Adore. It's under, uh, I guess, a uh, super cool link. Or no, We Heart the Adore where, is where I've hidden all these. So here's the Ephemera Society, the Bibliographical Society of America, the American Printing History Association, and on and on and on. These are websites that specialize in various forms of, um, in, in, in various areas. Uh, that we, you know, that, that specialize in either ephemera or, well, just just other things. So, um, anyway, I'm back. Um, what what got us on to ephemera? Uh, we, were, we were talking about um, things that are very difficult to search for using using keywords and search terms on the internet. These are things that really you almost have to go and look through a bin full of paper in order to find something really fascinating. Um, you can have a general subject that you're interested in, but it's really hard um, to, to because, because very often this stuff, like the object you were just, you were just showing us, very often this stuff is, is, um, is visual and doesn't have a lot of words. So if you don't have an author and a title or, you know, a, a year published or, you know, the kinds of information that, that you normally use to search for a book with, it, it, it's very hard to find um, a specific kind of object that you're looking for. Without totally agree that. with you. I had a Muhammad Ali, I still have it, a Muhammad Ali cookie bag where he made Champ's chocolate chip cookies and he signed the bag. I had the bag for about, the bag for about two or three years now. And I could never find, just what you were saying, I couldn't find a reference for it. Um, I had a guest on the radio program sometime a few months ago. There was um, his name was uh, the paper guy, Gian Carno. Um, I can't remember Agniti, Agnito, and he found some ephemera. And he found this particular piece of ephemera. Um, I'm probably not pronouncing the site's name. Worth Point, Point Worth, something like that. Okay, I'm or, not sure. Worth Point. 
worth point. Thank you, Alan. Um, and so there, you know, there was ephemera, and he had to look it up by title. So yeah, I I totally concur that looking looking for ephemera is really, you know, online is a tough thing. I could see where where this started. Then, Cynthia, let me let me digress for a little bit. Okay. You are also a book seller. Tell us about you and what you're doing in book selling. How can people reach you if they see this and? You're talking about something that you have that they might want. I am actually not actively book selling right now. Um, I've taken okay. a, a hiatus from that. Um, I moved a couple of years ago and uh, have been intending to move again relatively soon. And so taking my entire collection out of boxes and putting them all back in again seemed really daunting. And, and it's I bad idea to sell books that you can't find so <laughs> I try not to do that and I I'm sorry I just have to ask and the hula hoops in the background <laughs> the hula hoops um, in the background <laughs> I can give a demonstration but I don't advise <laughs> it <laughs> in the small space that we're in now I'll, I'll save that I'll, I'll send you some videos some other time oh, right. Alan, my Alan can fill me at the Florida Book Fair sometime I was getting um, my dollar ready well okay since you're not selling books then I'm gonna give you the third degree you're in trouble now kid okay um, it's, it's now time for the third degree but first let me remind you this is the Rare Book Cafe, brought to you by the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair. Um, the third degree. As every reader of all-time novels knows, when criminals gave policemen a hard time, they sat them down in a chair, shone a light in their face, and gave them a very grueling interview. Our version is less violent, but may be just as painful. Today, our guest is Cynthia Gibson. I lost my notes, guys. It's just a second. Oh, no, I'm trying. I was trying. Listen, let me just say this. We need a technical moment here. I'm trying to keep up with the notes in this. I couldn't do it all at once. Um, the third degree is every reader of all time detectives knows is when you were interviewed by the police. Our version is much less violent, but it could be just as painful. So, are you ready for the third degree, Cynthia? I am. Was there a book that you never returned to a library or friend? Oh, yes. Yes. I. It was an outright theft from a library. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I was in the Model United Nations. I it was in high school. I was the uh, single representative, I was the, the, the sole member of the delegation from um, the Palestine Liberation Organization, you remember those books? It wasn't very yes. popular, I got stuck with it. Um, and uh, so I kind of felt like I needed all the help I could get. Um, and the library had exactly one book that had any substantial information about position, public policy position kinds of things for the PLO. And uh, it was a reference book. It was a very small reference book, um, but you couldn't check it out. And I needed it. I was part of the Thai delegation when I was in college. Oh. <laughs> and we all went up to Boston and we mainly spent the weekend being told, go away, don't bother us by China. <laughs> right, right. Yes, yes. I, I didn't get to talk a lot, but, you know, at least I knew my, my policy positions if, if, if I had to. <laughs> what is your favorite guilty pleasure book? The kind you read when nobody's looking or the kind you hide in another dust jacket? I've read a Harlequin romance or two in my life, <laughs> I'll have to admit. <laughs> How long okay. Sorry? How long did they take? Oh, yeah. An hour? I, I, I don't know. I, don't I, had a, I had a work colleague when I was in college give me some because she said, you read all the time. You might enjoy these. And 
I was going through them in 20 minutes and I thought, oh God. They're snacks, I, right? I mean, they're absolutely, they're just bite-sized snacks. Right? I felt like I had to read them and it was, it was just painful. They're all also virtually the same. It's yeah. the same plot line over and over and over again, just different window dressing. It's been years. I had no idea how many there were until I was doing a, a, a big oh. project for the Salvation Army a few years ago, and someone gave them 3,000 of the British equivalent Mills and Boone. It right. was just a giant crate, only they seem to have a fetish for doctors and nurses there. Yeah, well, and I did, here's a fun, fun fact that uh, the single most uh, popular or the, or the most common uh, e-title, e-reader book, are romance, the, the, the short romance novels that are that are so so ubiquitous because um, for, for, for the very reason I suspect that that they use that statement, which is of course nobody wants to show what they're reading. So you can, you can be chowing down on Harlequin romances on the on the IRT and nobody will know what you're reading. It could be, well, it could I've, be heard some, I've heard some people say that is alone what keeps e readers going. It could it's, well be you can read forbidden stuff on there and no one will know what it is. It's a multi-billion dollar business. And especially for something like that, those those books were sold, uh, or for all I know still are, they were sold uh, by subscription. So you can get mm -hmm. six to 12 of them in your in your mailbox a month. So think about how much easier that is if you can just download six to 12 to 18 of them a month, you know, and, and as you say, go, go through them like the popcorn. Longer answer than you were expecting, wasn't it? No, <laughs> so, no, 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 no. no. I don't know. We just like to take over the show from Steve and see how he goes. Please, 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 please. please. You know, I'll chat behind you. Chat, 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 chat behind your back. Talk among yourselves. Talk among yourselves. That's what I was saying. I've had a target on my back before. What's the most expensive book you've ever seen or touched? Oh, um... That's an easy one. I was lucky enough to be in the sales room at Sotheby's uh, in New York a few years ago when they sold a copy of um, one of the earliest copies of the Magna Carta, um, which is not technically a book. It's a manuscript. It predates the, the printing press by four centuries or so. Um, but uh, it was one of the earliest, you know, hand handwritten copies that had been sent out to one of the barons who was one of the signatories. And <laughs> that uh, fetched a cool 20, 20 million, 21 million plus the, yeah. plus the big. <laughs> 21 point, you know, something plus. What yeah. book or books are on your nightstand? Oh, I have been reading um, Hannah Arendt recently um i've got uh origins of totalitarianism and uh and eichmann in jerusalem both are on my nightstand right now and i've been dipping into um christopher hitchens did a uh he, he was the editor on a great book of essays called arguably um which i've been dipping into and out of um which has all just been colored by the political atmosphere that we're in these days, I felt the need to do to do some of that reading. Do you, do you, do you find uh, that Hannah Arendt is due for a rediscovery given the times? Absolutely. I, I've, been, I've been arguing for several years that this truly is her moment. It is actually almost scary reading her right now because it could literally be ripped out of the newspaper, at least the better newspapers, the longer form, you know, kind, kind, kinds of, of journalism. Um, it's really thought provoking and actually kind of eerie, I have to say. Well, Jules Verne's rocket ship was fiction back then, who knows? Yeah, you know, that's less eerie. <laughs> <laughs> and let's yeah, yeah that's, that's that's more nostalgic and whimsical i think i'm, I'm going to give you question 4a before we go to the last okay. question did <laughs> you ever did you ever damage a rare book accidentally unintentionally you know oh i'm have damaged many oh including oh golly um if yeah uh, there's there could be someone listening or watch, watching who will re well remember the time I was putting a glass shelf 
helpfully into his case at the Boston Book Fair, I believe it was, and the shelf went crashing to the ground with many thousands of dollars worth of books on it. <laughs> One of which was irreparably damaged. But, yeah. Well done. Oh, okay. Ouch. Well done. <laughs> You're not alone. I've had a few front covers in one hand and the book in the other. It happens. Um, okay. The last question. What is your favorite curse word? And yes, this being on cable, you can say it, read it in a book. Well, there's favorite curse words. I'm very fond of the P words, pish and posh and pasha. But, I mean, for pure utilitarianism, I think you gotta go with fuck, right? Because <laughs> it's a verb, it's a noun, it's an adverb, it's an adjective. I mean, you know, it's, I don't think I can get through a day without it. So. <laughs> but, but here's a question for you. Is in Pasha, is the P pronounced? Because we know from the P.G. Woodhouse stories involving his character Smith, that the P is silent, as in pterodactyl. Um, my understanding is that it was pronounced, but of course, I first read it, I believe, in the Little House books, and maybe this is an Americanism. I don't know. I, I remember <laughs> being, as a young man being tickled by a character called Smith, who's, where Smith began with a P. Well, but of course, you're talking about an author who couldn't pronounce his own last name either. I mean, everyone knows it should be Little House. So, you know. <laughs> Whoa, whoa a minute, wait, whoa a minute. Um, Cynthia, I want to thank you for being a great sport today. And I got to ask you, Lindsay, it went by too fast. Was there something that I missed when you were IMing? I'm sorry? When, did you want to say something before that I might have missed in the message? No, no, I was just giving a time check. No problem. I just wanted to make sure because they flew by pretty quickly at once from different directions. Um, well, now that I realize the error of my time way, I guess I didn't have to give up this segment. And I would like for the historic record, as they say, or, you know, I'd, I'd like to show people what it actually took to sell a book in the pre-computer days. And it all started out, and Cynthia, somewhere in here, if we can do something as we spoke about earlier when I get to the book fair page. Um, Lindsay, if you could bring up, can you bring up the front cover of um, AB? I believe Alan has those. Alan? Okay. If not, don't worry about it. I, I, I'm a trained oh, technician here. Just, okay. Just keep going. Okay. Well, in the interim, I'm just going to show you. This is the way that it was done in the past what you had to do was subscribe to this magazine and that was only part of the process the subscription to this magazine was somewhere between eight and twelve thousand with a reread time story each week the yearly had different articles on the trade but the backbone of it was what they call the want ads. <laughs> Alan, can we do a want ads or should I just continue the way I was? You just have to let the technology take over. Okay. A moment. So what did you do in the want ads? Well, basically, we'll give you a close-up of it in a second, but basically in the want ads, you were reading, for example, these were the books that Powell's Books wanted that particular week. You can have a full page ad. You can have other types of advertisement, but the gist of it was that is how people communicated in pre-computer days that a bookstore in Portsmouth, New Hampshire wanted a book that you coincidentally had in your stock somewhere in New Mexico. Now, how did you guys communicate? <coughs> Today, it's done through email and other things, and if you do it the right way, within a flash, you can list a book, sell a book, and through PayPal, you can have the deal done within 24, 48 hours or less. 
not counting the time it takes to ship the book. The earlier days when we had to walk to school barefooted and feed the horse at the same time, we used, if you, are we on postcard or just keep going? Go ahead and just show them. Just keep going, okay. What you did was you used a postcard. And whether you typed it out or whether you printed it out, basically you were addressing a postcard. On the back card, you would list the book and reference which particular AB weekly it was. And I had a little fun with the dates and Rod Serling and the telephone numbers. The book is actually a rare book on Western Americana, but in abbreviations and other forms, you would list it postpaid. Somebody would mail you the book, and you, somebody would mail you the check. You would then mail them the book. And if everything was as described, you cashed the check and didn't have to send a refund. One of the other things, and this kind of ends it, if anybody ever finds, if you're new to the rare book world, and you are looking to get an idea of topics, especially in nonfiction, you would look at the AB, and you would see if you can find an old AB, it's a great teaching tool. While everybody might not be in business anymore, the subject matter is still the same. Nothing much has changed there. Maybe a few authors went in and out of vogue. And one of the other things that when Stephen King, for example, when Stephen King came out, you would see requests for um, advertisements seeking Stephen King's earlier books. First, you would see it in one page. Then a couple of weeks later, you would see it in two and three pages. And then it eventually became a box ad. So you got an idea as to what is being collected. Well, today you don't have the AB to learn from, but there are tremendous schools to go to. I just highly recommend that if anybody finds any old issues of this magazine, read it, study it. You're not going to look for the titles. And also remember, this was all in pre-computer days. If your inventory wasn't on index cards, there was no computer. So you, had to, you had to have a good memory. And that basically is the last time I'm going to talk about the AB on this program for a long time. But that is the history of book selling. Um, I am now going to take a break for a minute. And I am going to introduce somebody we all know and love. Professor Thorne Donnelly's Book Corner. Thorne, are you ready? Well, of course I'm ready. But are we going to well, Edie? The re no, we're going to you and then to Edie, or did I do the okay. wrong thing and reverse it? Yeah, it's okay. We'll go to me. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to take it. Okay, uh, what I, I was going to talk about today, that's okay. what I was going to no, talk wait, about last, next, this week, Okay, it looks to me like we're going to go get Edie, or yeah, not. I'm sorry. We are, we are supposed to be getting Edie now. Yes, we are. My okay. apology. Well, I'll tell you what. Well, Edie's kind of coming up here, but I first wanted to remind you that the Rare Book Cafe is brought to you by the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair. And that's going to be held, as it always is, in the historic Art Deco Coliseum in St. Petersburg, Florida. If you've never been to it, it's a great building across the street. It's actually a life-size chess set, which you just have to see. I've never played on it, but it should be fun. Our next, uh, their 36th annual fair, I can't believe it's that old, is coming up on April 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. And if you want to have some more information, go to floridabooksellers.com uh, slash bookfair, but please wait till our show is over with. And here is Edie, but first I want to ask her a question. Edie, how are you feeling? I am feeling better than I deserve. Thank you for it. Welcome. Enjoying. All right. My, I'll tell you one thing. You guys all look so handsome since I had my eye cataract surgery done. And I'm seeing colors and things that I haven't seen for a long time. It's just so good to be back. I can't even begin to tell you. Today, I am going to be talking about things that I buy that are not necessarily miniature books, but that I see and I've got to have. Anybody that loves books has seen that where 
they just have to have something in their own individual collection is one of those things that I saw. I had gotten this at one of the Florida antiquarian book fairs that we attended. And what this is, is Walt Disney Studios tiny theater with 12 tiny Disney books. Now, the books are in here. And I had told everybody that a true miniature book, dollar bill, you fold it in half, you fold it in half, and this is the size of a true miniature. Well, obviously, these tiny books are bigger than a true miniature. I saw this at the Florida Book Fair in St. Pete. It haunted me. And I knew that if I didn't have this in my collection, it would haunt me for a long time. And whenever I see it, I smile a lot. Up here, and I can't open it, and I'll tell you why in a minute. If you open up these two windows here, you get to see a little scene from Snow White Wars. I found this on a couple of sites, and it is listed as a scarce item, even though it was done in 1981, and as you get older, 1981 is not so long ago, but compared to when I was born, <laughs> it's not so long ago. Mine is still wrapped in the original cellophane package so that I'm not opening this or I would have to tear off the original package, which I'm not going to do, although I love you all very much. Mm -hmm. It is being scarce and hard to find. I absolutely love this little book. For the most part, when I show miniature books here, those miniature books will indeed fall into the realm of take a dollar bill in half, fold it in half, fold it in half. The miniature book should be no bigger than that. And for that, I thank Michael Garbett in England who taught me that trick when he first turned me on to miniature books. Here I am, back again, showing you my golden treasure of tiny books, which I value and I adore. When people buy miniature books, yes, a lot of them are very, very pricey. And I have some that are very, very pricey. But a lot of them are not pricey. And they're just fun to have fun to hold, fun to play with. If you're not a super klutz like I am, where I can trip over my own feet, or the way I fell down on New Year's Eve day, thank goodness I've got good padding, all prime beef, so I didn't break anything. But I'm first starting to walk again well, going out to the catwalk outside of our apartment. And Thank God I didn't break anything. Thank God my cataract surgery. Thank you, Thorne. It went very, very well. I see the doctor again on the 20th. And anybody that needs it, by all means, have it. Because it's unbelievable what I did not see before. I have a question for EDN, Cynthia. Are there any book fairs that concentrate or or have a niche within them relating to miniature books? Oh, there's a conclave once a year. Cynthia, do you know about that? Yes, absolutely, yes. Have you ever been to it? I have, yes. I was at uh, in Seattle five or six years ago, six or seven years ago now, I guess. Oh, longer than that, maybe. Yeah, but yes, it's fantastic. Um, and when there is, uh, sometimes the 
miniature book, the annual meeting is also in a town where there's a book fair happening nearby. And when that happens, the booksellers always try and bring as many of their miniature books as possible because it's kind of a captive audience. You get uh, uh, miniature book collectors, like every other form of collector, are, are, are rabid. <laughs> oh, I, you know, it's unbelievable. It's, I have never been to a conclave. It's one. It's on my bucket list. Sometimes. Oh, you have to. Oh, you must. You must. But I have met Karen Nyman, and I knew Don Brady. I mean, I God bless Don Brady. You should rest in peace. And I love miniature books. And everybody at in St. Pete, they know that while Stephen is working hard to set up, and I'm in the booth but I can't help him with what he does I'm running around to say to everybody did you bring any miniature books this year did you bring any miniature books and then if I see something that I just can't live without it becomes part of my collection but the conclave it sounds extraordinary and there is a traveling miniature book collection exhibit that goes from library to library around the country i have not seen that either yet but i have seen photographs of different people with the most extraordinary collections and one is more beautiful than the other it's is a that lot the of collection um, who's who, is, is that the bromers collection that's traveling around from library to library is that the one issued in conjunction with their book? Yes, yes it is. And that is yes. one of them, but there are others. And I know that they're available for different libraries around the country that have the security to exhibit the miniature books in locked right. cases, of course. But right, well, climate control and yeah, all of that, right, absolutely, yeah. Right, but I, I oh, well, Edie, you just inspired me. While you were talking, I zipped over to bookfairs.com to check and see. I, I cannot believe that I don't have a link there to the Miniature Book Society. So I will be adding that. It will be up by the end of today. There will be a link, an active link on bookfairs.com website so that anyone who goes there can link to the Miniature Book people. And anybody in that miniature, I, I would also suggest you look at Bibliophile. And I would also suggest that you look, uh, you know, at different publications that come out exclusively on miniature books. The articles that you get by one of the miniature book societies, I look forward to getting them every single month because it's a wealth of information and uh, it's extraordinary. That became my own, I mean, there are miniature book bookends. Okay. Yes. You know, yes. And I oh. will be showing in the future things like a miniature book on drinking and uh, uh, cocktail recipes that was done in a corkscrew. The book is housed inside of a corkscrew. That's fantastic. Thimbles. And inside the thimbles, there are miniature books that give you sewing recipes. <laughs> I mean, it, the, the contents and the way people put them together, they're so clever. And as I say, I love this. I think it's just extraordinary. And like in Walt Disney, this is lovely. And there are 12 little books in here, little Disney books. And mine are brand new mine yeah. are perfect not for you, sale not for yeah. sale but you i love it this earlier when we were talking about ephemera but that box is a really great example of ephemera something that absolutely was not intended to survive i mean can you imagine the very many children getting their hands on that and letting it come away in one piece that's why any, so any of the copies that i've seen online are fair to good and well scarce to find. <laughs> but I love mine. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It's good to see you all again. Healthy, happy new year. I am going to give you back to Steve. Who I can now see with my new eye. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Edie. It was good to see you back. We miss you. <laughs> it's always good to hear about miniature books. 
And my devious little mind was when you were talking about security, I was thinking, yes, they fit in your pocket so nicely. But uh, they are beautiful. I love the typography in them. The, the actual manufacturing of miniature books fascinates me. I think uh, Steve actually had, had a story once about he bought a, from a, a prominent miniature book person. Of his, I believe he actually saw or bought his printing press and all that kind of stuff. Is that true, Steve? Well, we didn't buy the printing press. I got what um, typography books I could from him. There were no tools. Basically, I got his library. But I thought you were going to the story where using the AB Bookman's Weekly, somebody always used to advertise in there that they wanted books on um, Florida, um, Christopher Columbus, Cuba, and miniature books. We never knew who the book dealer was buying all of that stuff for until one day um, the book dealer was no longer alive and the person that he bought them from, I wound up getting into the house to do the estate sale. So I saw all this, all these books on Cuba. I saw all these books on um, Columbus and other things. So I got those for the inventory. Somewhere in a room there was a box. It had about 200 miniature books in it. We bought those also, and that started, I guess, after Edie had bought some books and decided she was focusing in on miniature book collection, four of her collection. Um, anyway, uh, Professor Donnelly. All right, well, I thought I would talk a little bit this week about, you know, you mentioned the old way of selling uh, books was AB Bookman, which is, which is true. But uh, I was going to talk about a couple ways you can sell currently. I thought we talked about last week, you know, some of the educational facilities. But, you know, people kind of, kind of want to know, well, okay, what do I do when I grow up? I want to, want to be a book, book person. You know, the first and most obvious is, is open a bookstore. And in my little research, I was curious because bookstores come and go. We all know the fate of, uh, of uh, Borders and Barnes & Noble, you know, is, is questionable. Um, I understand that new independent bookstores are doing uh, reasonably well. The ABA says that they are. But at any rate, uh, I was curious, what is the oldest bookstore in the world? And I just found out what it was. It is called Monrovia's Bookstore. It's in Allen, of all places, I would have thought it would be in Switzerland or London or someplace. It's in Allentown, Pennsylvania. It was founded in 1745, still in existence. Still selling books. I was not able to today to quickly determine if it was original uh, family ownership, but I believe from uh, the looks of the pictures, this is an old stone building. I believe it might actually be in the original location. I'm not sure of that, but at least the corporate entity is going along there. So you, that's one thing you have to do. That'll be a hard act to follow, but there still are a lot of what we call bricks and mortar uh, book fairs around. They are uh, they're everywhere, most countries. Uh, I happen to have one, though. I may be uh, selling the building I'm in, and that would cause uh, some changes for me. But uh, the next obvious category is you know, the online world. And uh, people, we get people in here all the time, and some people know about Amazon. I, I will also be like Cynthia, not lie. I have an Amazon account. I don't sell many books there. I, I, might, I produced a... Uh, published a book on a gentleman by the name of John Boke, who is a fairly famous architect, and I, I have the new copy, so I do sell on Amazon as one of my places, but uh, a lot of people do have Amazon accounts. Uh, if you get a little bit more professional, uh, there are accounts such as uh, ABE, uh, BBO, uh, there, there's numer numerous uh, independent book uh, for-profit companies, that's not a big secret, ABE is owned by Amazon, and people get a little We'll think that's a big secret. I guess it's not anymore, but Bibio is out there. And there's a, there's a fair number of, of sites where you, you have to be a, a bookseller. By that, I mean you have to have a, a resale license, uh, to do your sales tax, and all that kind of stuff. But they, they can provide a simple, like a little uh, a bookstore for you, a little a mini website, if you will. And a lot of people just do that. Uh, I have been, in the past, I've done most of my aquarium stuff. Uh, in, in my bookstore and online. A lot of people are quite happy with just doing online stores. 
I know a lot of people that just, that own brick and brick and mortar stores, and quite simply, they say that's a source of inventory, which I have done for the, uh, myself over the years. Just a couple of ideas. A lot of it depends on you know what kind of location you can get. Do you want to deal with the retail situation? It's a personality thing. Another way of doing it, though, is a catalogs. Catalogs are kind of an interesting situation. Back to Steve. There are a number of people to this day, very prominent book dealers, that produce absolutely beautiful, well thought out, expensively produced catalogs. Uh, some of the old line book sellers come to mind, but also some, uh, they, even down to this big, the people are still sending out uh, maybe, you know, mimeograph copies. I'm not sure what Steve has there, but he's got some catalogs. A beautiful uh, catalog. <laughs> oh yeah okay and people oddly enough collect catalogs i probably have in my own collection several hundred catalogs i know steve does they're actually a, a great source for reference uh people collect them going back to you know hundreds of years before to get accurate descriptions on books that maybe are no longer available or have been you know uh had uh, especially european <laughs> books i understand a lot of people use them for reference for books that were destroyed especially german books or english in world war ii that literally do not exist anymore but perhaps the catalogs do so if you have something there uh i have not done it but I'm, i get a lot of them people do online catalogs uh um, almost every online seller that i know of, a couple times a year once a year once a week it, it's all over the place uh, there's some software that's, that makes it fairly easily, once you get the hang of it, to produce an online catalog. That uh, is still somewhat costly. It's costly in your own time. The mail-out catalogs, I've noticed, generally nowadays are limited to maybe 500 or a couple thousand recipients because they frankly cost a, cons uh, a considerable amount of money to produce. So most booksellers with the, the, uh, the printed catalogs limit them to customers or in my case, a couple of times I've requested a catalog and they will sell it, obviously, as a sales situation. And the last thing though, that's kind of dear to my heart, and we've all kind of alluded to it when we started with Cynthia, yeah, are book fairs. Uh, we, everybody on this show is involved with the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair in, in one way or another, either through this, this uh, broadcast or actually having booths there. Steve and my booths are actually right next to each other there. A book fair is a great deal of fun. As Cynthia so well put it, you can see the books. You can talk talk to booksellers that are knowledgeable. You can compare books. Uh, you can perhaps negotiate. You know what, whatever. They're absolutely great. And there's, I, I'm, I think I heard Cynthia say she has over a hundred, well over a hundred, maybe 150 listed in America. And I would probably just guess there's another 50 around the world. The book fairs are are really quite nice. Uh, there's there's ones that I'm, I personally do to the Fava, and there's up in New York, the, the granddaddy of all is the New York Book Fair. Uh, but people, and there's also, that's a, a AAVA Book Fair. They have one in Boston and California, but they, so those are the, the major book fairs. But what's kind of fun, and I do, started to do, are what's uh, called the shadow fairs or satellite fairs. Well, those are a one-day book fair run, well, put together by other, other promoters. And what it amounts to is it's usually on a Saturday. I think one of them, I think the New York this year is going to be on a Friday, I've been told, because of the scheduling difference. And they're really kind of fun because they're, all, they're, they're one day. There are different booksellers than what you would see in uh, the, the bigger book fairs. But there's an awful lot of really nice stuff there. And for somebody that's interested in getting a start in book fairs, uh, I would strongly suggest ours in uh, St. Pete is, I think, the I believe it's the third or fourth largest in America now in terms of number of booksellers. And we've been getting a great deal of traffic updates. Somebody tonight said something about um, that we, you know, that we, uh, yeah, we're getting a lot of younger people, which is good. Uh, those shadow fairs that I was talking about in New York and Boston, I believe there's one in California and some other places. Cynthia would be the one to tell you more about that. Uh, they, uh, they're much less expensive to do. It's a lot easier. You go, you show up, you, you set it up for one day, and, and you're out of there. It's not a four-day event. They might be worth doing. And so those are just some of the venues you can use. I'm, I know that we're getting kind of towards the end of the afternoon here. I'm going to yeah. give it back to you, but there's a lot of ways to buy and sell books, and 
I'm sure there's a couple of them I haven't even thought about. So, Steve, which, thank you. Thank you, Thorne, which we will talk about perpetually on this show. Um, thanks, Thorne. And now, a new occasional feature. Lindsay Thompson says she sells rare books as much or more for what is in them and for their authors as for their value as things. Lindsay, what's on your mind? Well, what's on my mind today, Stephen, is the clock, and we are out of time. So wow. I was going to talk about Richard Halliburton today. His birthday fell this week. Those interested in knowing who he was can read about him on the uh, book the book fair website on Blogspot, and perhaps another week we can pick up with this feature. So it looks like it's time for you to be in wrapping up things today. Well. As Lindsay just said so eloquently, that's all the time we have for today. We'll be back next week with Tampa author and Cigar District bookseller Gigi Best, a rare book cafe regular. Wrapping up for the first month of the cafe new year will be California bookseller John Howell on the 28th. During the week, join us on Rare Book Cafe's Facebook page, where we invite you to comment, question, and share with us and your, share us with your friends and relations. You can also email us questions and comments at send, and send us pictures of your treasures. We'd be happy to tell you what they're worth at rarebookcafe at gmail.com. That's rarebookcafe at gmail.com. And please don't forget to join me next week on WDBFradio.com for Books on the Bookshelf. That's noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. My guest will be Arnold Herr, who just wrote a book about the wild rides of a Hollywood book dealer. The Rare Book Cafe is brought to you by the Florida Antiquarian Book Fair, celebrating 36 years. April 21st through 23rd, 2017. The Florida Antiquarian Book Fair features more than 120 dealers from around the world, around the country, and it's bookselling paradise. Next week, happy book sales to all.